Hello and welcome to my channel. In this channel, we explain various nursing concepts in a simple form for better and easy understanding. These videos could be used by both LPN and RN students as well as nurses who are trying to refresh their basic concepts. My name is Nas Mosh. So this video, we are continuing to speak about our inflammatory bowel diseases and let's talk about pancreatitis. With pancreatitis, this is where we have autodigestion of the pancreas by pancreatic digestive enzyme. So they prematurely activate before they reach the intestine. So the pancreas releases these pancreatic digestive enzymes, right? And they're supposed to wait to get to the digestive intestines. Are the intestines? They're supposed to wait to get to the intestines, but no. These guys activate. They start digesting from as soon as they're released. They start digesting whatever they get in contact with. So the first contact they'll get with will be the pancreas, whoever releases them. Some risk factors will of this include bowel tract disease, alcohol abuse, GI surgery, trauma, and medication toxicity. Signs and symptoms of this include severe left quadrant pain or epigastric pain. It could be radiating to the back or even the left shoulder. We could also note some nausea and vomiting of the patient could report that. Tina sign could also be a possibility, which is ecmosis of the flux. We could also see colon sign, which is a blue-gray discoloration of the umbilus or your belly button, as well as the patient could be jaundice and could have ascites and tetany. Labs that you're going to know with note with this patient will be, or monitor, will be the amylase and lipase levels, which will be elevated. We'll also have an elevation of our white blood cells, the bilirubin, as well as glucose, since what? The pancreas produces insulin, and insulin is what transports your glucose from your blood into your cells. We'll have a decrease in calcium and magnesium as well as your platelet levels. So with this patient, what do we need to know? We need to put, as a nurse, ensure this patient is first placed on NPO diet. Then we place an NG tube. Remember, safety precautions when the patient is placed on an NG tube. We administer antimatics for the nausea and vomiting. Zofran is one of them. We provide insulin for the hyperglycemia. IV fluids. Flush this patient. Flush them, right? Flush them as much as possible or even flood them with IV fluids. We also give them some electrolytes due to a chance of electrolyte imbalance. Opioid analgesics for pain, pancreatic enzymes with foods. Any kind of food you're giving this patient, you need to give them that pancreatic enzyme. The enzyme, but it's not reaching where the enzyme is supposed to be used, right, or utilized. So give them this pancreatic enzyme with any meal or snack they consume. Eventually, this patient will give them a blunt, low-fat diet once the severe exubation is over. So our maintenance diet is a what? A blunt, low-fat diet. Patient teaching. We always teach this patient to what? No alcohol. No alcohol consumption is recommended of any kind. We encourage them to attend what? Alcohol Anonymous or other alcoholic recovery groups. They should also not smoke. They also need to reduce their stress, right? Find ways of stress maintenance. Some of the complications of this disorder include type 1 diabetes. You could end up having type 1 diabetes because remember, Type 1 diabetes is when this patient does not have any insulin production. And when we are auto-digesting our pancreas, which produces an, our insulin, we're not going to have any insulin. We could also end up with chronic pancreatitis and also pancreatitis pseudocytes. Hepatitis. So hepatitis is inflammation of your liver. And we have various causes of hepatitis. We have hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. We could have alcohol as our cause of hepatitis as well as autoimmune disorder. So with hepatitis A, 
This is transmitted through the fecal oral route. A good example of this is right. Somebody poops in a farm where we are growing carrots, right? This person has hepatitis A. Poops on top of the carrots. You go take this carrot and eat it. You didn't wash it. Fecal oral route. Hepatitis B and C is transmitted through blood and bodily fluids. There are vaccines for A and B, but we don't have any vaccines for C. So our risk factors for this include IV drug use, right? We are sharing these needles, the IV drugs, you know, no septic use. We're not using safety precautions with this. Or you're a nurse, you get injected with a patient needle that you didn't use the safety precaution in needles disposing or something like that. Body piercings, tattoos, unprotected sex, traveling to underdeveloped countries, crowded living environments. Some signs and symptoms of hepatitis include flu-like symptoms. These flu-like symptoms are malice, body aches, fever. The patient will have jaundice, right? They'll have dark-colored urine and clay-colored stools. The lab values that will monitor or will note with this, they'll be elevated ALT and SLT levels. Why? Our liver is not functioning. As well as elevated bilirubin. Treatment for hepatitis. With hepatitis A, there's no treatment. It will normally let it self-limit, right? With self-limit and bed rest, it treats itself. But with chronic hepatitis B and C, they are anti viral medications, which we normally give the patients. Cirrhosis. So cirrhosis is where the normal liver tissues are replaced with fibrotic scar tissue, right? We don't have good tissue anymore with the liver. They're all fibrotic scarred tissues. Some causes of this is post-necrotic cirrhosis, which could be due to a infection like a viral hepatitis infection. It could also be toxins which damage your liver, also medication that damage your liver. So we can have either Lennox cirrhosis or biliary cirrhosis. So with Lennox cirrhosis, this is where a patient is a chronic alcoholic. With biliary cirrhosis, this is due to chronic biliary obstruction. So signs and symptoms of this will be ascites, pitachiae, which are red dots on your skin, will have the patient will be, will have jaundice, puritis, which is illness, itchiness, palmar arrhythmia, spider angionomers. They will have theta hepatitis. They will have fruity breath odor. They'll have also peripheral edema and also what? Confusion due to encephalopathy. With labs, we're going to note an elevation with our AST and ALT as well as bilirubin and ammonium levels. And we'll have a decrease in serum, protein, albumin, red blood cells. And with decreased red blood cells, what are we going to note? Decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit levels. And as well, we're going to have decreased platelets as well as a general low blood levels. Diagnosis. To diagnose cirrhosis, we're going to have a liver biopsy, which is our golden standard way of diagnosing Crohn's disease. We can also have an ultrasound, CT scan, as well as MRIs. When it comes to nursing care, we always monitor these patients' eyes and O's, inputs and outputs. We restrict fluids, sodium, as well as sodium as ordered. We will always elevate the head of the bed. And when we are elevating the patient's head of the bed, we are trying to help them breathe easily. Their diet should be a high carb, moderate fat, high protein, low sodium, vitamins and minerals may oil may need to, to be provided as well. We encourage the patient to consume several small meals a day. When a patient has some GI disorder, we always encourage them to eat little meals, not a lot, because that's where the problem is. We need to take baby steps slowly. Baby, baby your GI system. We always measure this up 
patient's abdominal girth daily. We don't want that increase in the abdomen because of the ascites, right? And we normally measure it over the largest part. We wash this patient's skin with cool water and apply lotion. This is to help with that itchiness, puritis. We encourage the patient to join some kind of alcohol recovery program if that is their cause of their cirrhosis. Some medications that these patients will be given will be Lanctulose. Lanctulose is a laxative, but that laxative, it helps in binding ammonia and excrete it. And this is because of the encephalopathy. With encephalopathy is due to increased ammonium levels. And once we'll know this medication is working, if there's what? Decreased confusion in the patient. We also monitor for signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. And we administer diuretics because of the fluids, right, in the body. Some procedures that can be performed include paracentitis. So as we talked about, paracentitis is the removal of fluid from the abdominal because this patient with liver damage, they normally have ascites, right? And remember the precautions for this. You have the patients empty their bladder prior to the procedure and the patient is normally placed on supine position with their head elevated. We assess the extracted fluid from the parentitis and by taking a look at there, when you assess, we check what? The color of the fluid that we've removed or extracted and also the amount of the fluid we've removed. We go back and measure the abdominal gut. Remember, you measured it before and now we are measuring it after the procedure. And long-term treatment for this patient is liver transplant, which might be needed for, you know, this liver cirrhosis patient. Some complications that a patient will end up with with liver cirrhosis include the encephalopathy, which is due to ammonia buildup, as well as esophageal variants, right? That push the pressure in your stomach, backing up your gastric content, burning your esophagus, and then what? Continuous of burning of your esophagus and backing up of your gastric will end up with what? Esophageal variants. One key thing to remember, if a patient has H. pylori bacteria, this H. pylori normally causes peptic ulcer disease. And when treating a patient with uh, peptic ulcer disease due to H. P. pylori bacteria, we treat them with various medications, a number of medications, and this will be either two to three different types of antibiotics to increase the effectiveness of therapy and also to reduce what? Drug resistance. Other medications that we could use include proton pumps inhibitors, mucosal protectants. Thank you for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe to my channel. See you on the next one. Bye.